Okie dokie now. <laughs> March 1st, 2020. What's up? And, and here we are with another uh, week of Yawa questions and answers. And I will be moderating, mediating? potentially mediating for these two. Um, I'm going to help. You're going to read the questions. I'm going to read the questions and help keep us on topic and like moving forward. Because uh, sometimes these two can uh, have a little bit too much fun and get off track. So here I am to help us. For any of you that don't know, this is... Peter Armstrong, he's been on before, he's my buddy, and he'll be on again. And he's a doctor of veterinary medicine. And then we're just us, so. <laughs> first question, and this first question is going to be for Peter, since he's our guest, are um, from Facebook, from Harry Hooper. Our five-month-old Drothar has started to eat large amounts of small stones or gravel every time he is let out into the paddock, orchard to relieve himself, and when out walking off lead in the fields around our property. Is there anything he's deficient in? He has fed Purina Pro Plan puppy food for athletic dogs, or do you have any suggestions on how to break this habit? We don't want to keep him on lead when walking, etc. Thanks for any advice you can give. So would you say that there's a deficiency? Typically or? not a deficiency. So most of the time, if we do occasionally see that where dogs will eat dirt. So there is a time when they'll be deficient to eat dirt, but there's really not going to be a lot they're going to get from rocks. So um, it may be more of a behavior learn thing. Um, so that may be kicked back to y'all in the training department. <laughs> Just a quick question though. Is there like a simple blood test or something that they can run to see if there's a deficiency to know if there's something that we potentially need to not look Not really. Um, I mean... I think he says, right, he's feeding ProPlan. Is that yep, correct? Yeah, ProPlan, so five-month-old. ProPlan is going to be balanced enough that it's going to have all the minerals that, that need to be there for, for him. Um, so it's probably more of a behavioral issue, I would think. So you said minerals, and the only thing that I can think with that would be volume of food. That was something that was brought up to me talking to dog food people is if he's not eating enough dog food or he's eating too much, that could cause the mineral imbalance. Yeah, and then obviously from a health standpoint – really discourage that because that's setting us up for a big set of problems if we've got a belly full of rocks. Yes, definitely a belly full of rocks can lead to blockages and other things like that that are not good. Um, but suggestions on how to break this habit is he could potentially be bored and he's just trying to entertain himself. Uh, he's five months old. That's typically a good age when dogs are really needing more training. Um, and uh, something that you can do so that you don't have to have him on leash to keep him away from those situations is work on collar conditioning to yeah. recall. That way, if you see him going out, grabbing a rock, even if he's got one in his mouth, you can recall him back to you, take that rock away, and redirect his focus to something else, maybe play some retrieving games. It sounds like he really likes to pick stuff up, carrying them around in his mouth. Let's maybe. do that with a bumper or some retrieving toy that isn't going to cause a problem. Even the young puppies that we have like to pick up rocks when available and carry them around. Now, there's a difference between eating all of the rocks in sight and picking one up and carrying it around, but it does sound like um, being able to distract him with something else or doing more training or more exercise, something could help with that. Next question, and this is from Instagram from Shrobert. Shrobert. I think Shrobert's Shrobert asked a question asked, yeah. before. Shrobert, Shrobert values our information. <laughs> um, <laughs> Protective vests for upland hunts in rough country for chucker and pheasants. Do you use them and any issues with overheating, etc. any brand or style recommended? As far as vests go, this is for dogs? I'm going to just answer this because he obviously didn't listen to the question <laughs> at all. So, yes, we use upland vests for the dogs to protect their chests um, and thick cover, protects them from, you know, potential barbed wire cuts and tears and lacerations as well. We use Lion Country Supplies Bird Dog Armor. It's uh, more of a chest protector, not necessarily a full body vest. We don't recommend using a neoprene vest, especially for upland hunting, because yes, the dogs can overheat if you use them, um, especially in warmer conditions. 2020 goals, we'll have a uh, dog vest on our own line. Hashtag goals. <laughs> Hashtag goals. Okay, next question from Stephen McBride, 
This is a long one. So, so my eight month old female GSP came into heat recently and I've also just got an e-collar for her. Yes, it's a DT systems collar. Whoop whoop. Thanks for you guys recommending that brand. I can't tell you how much it's made a difference being able to have her off leash and having the confidence that she is paying attention and not going to run off. Ivy's doing great with e-collar training when it comes to the come command and checking back in with me when off leash. The question I have is, I can't seem to get her enthused on retrieving. She seems to just want to hang near me and wanting a treat for coming or staying close. Also, didn't know where to ask this question, so I'm glad you messaged it to us. You, you asked me. No. <laughs> it was too long of a question. It was too, too long, didn't read. Um, but seriously, go ahead, Kat. So why don't I answer? Oh, oh, I'm, yes, please, I, I please do. I like a dog once. So I think for me, like when I'm doing like retrieving stuff, like getting somewhere undistracted and working on that. Um, so like for me, like as I started with a puppy, right? So start in the hallway and then start with something with zero distractions. That helps me to help those puppies focus. That's probably not good dog training advice, but. Uh, that's no, that's a really great start. Um, I would also recommend, it sounds like you're still utilizing treats um, with a lot of her training. And if she's collar conditioned and truly collar conditioned, you really don't need those treats to be overlaid with the collar anymore. And if you can remove them from your training session, she's not gonna be so directly focused on you looking for that next food reward. Um, and when we typically start working with puppies and retrieving, we don't use food rewards and treats at all anymore in training because when that puppy brings a toy back, a retrieving object back, but they're looking for a treat, what does that mean? That means that bumper's getting spit out of their mouth so that they can eat a treat. And I would prefer those dogs not want to drop that bumper, not want to drop that retrieving toy because if it's a bird, I don't want it dropped. So I would just remove the treats from your sessions as well since she is collar conditioned to recall now, it sounds like, and then you um, might be able to get away from that issue altogether. The bonus or the caveat to this whole situation is anything a dog's doing, they're conditioning themselves to. And the fact that you're recognizing that this is an issue and putting the stop to it now is gonna help make you a better dog trainer down the road. So kudos. Yes. Next question, Next question for Peter from Instagram, mmnesia18. If I butcher these, I am sorry. Has, tell us how to say it. Tell us how to say it. I'll not mess it up in the future. Has there been any negative side effects to the anti-venom vaccines? And when is it recommended to give it? Um, so I really like the anti, uh, or most people call them like a rattlesnake vaccination. Um, I really like them for dogs. Um, I don't think they are the cure-all catch-all, um, especially like if we get into early spring when there's a lot of um, the snake bites that we get have a lot of venom. But I think they do buy us more time. Um, I think they lessen the severity of the bites. Um, that's what we see in my clinic with giving those. And we, we deal with quite a few rattlesnake and copperhead bites. It's going to protect against um, all North American um, species of snakes. Um, we probably, if the reactions, you know, if we compare reactions, it probably has a little bit more reactions than, say, a rabies vaccination or a regular distemper parva vaccination. Um, typically, um, and it's just, I think it's probably technology based. The, the reaction that they have is going to be usually like a local site reaction, not necessarily like an anaphylactic reaction. So most of the problems that we see are related to um, a big lump, uh, be a lump or not even a big lump, but a lot of times we can bring those dogs in, drain that abscess, put on some antibiotics and they're fine. So, um, less, still less than 5% or less than 4%. Um, are going to have a reaction like sure. that to it. Yeah. Um, and then the big thing with that. So I always, it's always timing of year for me. So like if I give one in December uh, or say November, they're typically six months is the recommendation on those. Um, so we'll usually come back and start them again in March. So we'll start pretty quickly um, doing a lot of rattlesnake vaccinations. Especially here where we're at in Texas, yeah, where so rattlesnakes are more prevalent. Here really quickly. Warming up, those snakes Whoa. are moving. I've, I think I've heard, maybe I heard incorrectly that you have to do a booster 30 booster, days later. Yeah, yep. okay. so. Um, so if you're on there every six months or, or even really even once a year, we'll do this the one, but yeah, for dogs that are starting it, we'll do it. Um, we'll say we did it tomorrow. We do it again in 30 days. So, but I think they work. I think they have their place for sure. And buying us more time. Um, time. That's and I, and I, a... I practice in a small rural practice and we'll, um, we get to summertime. We'll, there'll be certain times of year. We treat one a day at least. 
bite. Of bites. Of bites, yeah. And do you ever see, I'm going to ask my own question here because I think this is an interesting and important topic. Uh, Do you see the dogs that are coming in, have they had the vaccine? And do you see benefits from that? in reactions? Um, it really depends. Um, or you're seeing kind of a gamut of... A little bit of everything, everything, yeah. So a lot of times it can be, yeah, we'll see dogs. And a lot of times that dictates um, what I do therapy-wise, right? So plus or minus steroids, plus or minus NSAIDs, um, plus or minus anti-venom, you know, if it's on the leg versus on the face. Um, I would always rather a dog get bit on the face than on the leg um, just because there's only so much swelling that can happen in the leg. And usually a couple of days later, we get a lot of necrosis sloughing yeah and sloughing sl- necrosis on the leg well i kind of like this trend of peter questions so we're gonna go with another one Sounds good. <laughs> keep it going from the life of carl on instagram what do you suggest for dry skin um so dry skin's tough right so there can be a lot of things yeah it can be a lot of things if we're talking about dry flaky skin um there can be some uh, metabolic reasons thyroid's a really good reason to have some dry flaky skin um, and we'll see that definitely in the short hair breed um, or some of the other German breeds. Um, those are can be a problem. Um, it may just be a time of year. Um, so you may try, you know, moisturizing shampoos or things along those lines may help. Um, those are, you know, just some ideas of that. But I don't typically get too overly concerned. Um, I, I always love probiotics. Um, I think feeding a probiotic when you get to those times of year to try to help get good gut health is so much tied to good um, skin health. Um, I think there's really some, in, some improvements that can have that dog food. If you're feeding us, you know, a suboptimal dog food, um, and that's a big debate for anybody, but, um, dog food can definitely contribute to that. So kind of, um, those are things that I would look at for dry skin. And I also noticed like with our own personal dogs, especially puppies that may have multiple accidents and things like that, over bathing seems to really dry out their coats and mm-hmm. they'll get a little bit more flaky. So if you can avoid giving baths, so frequently it allows their natural oils and things to help with moisture and conditioning just like ladies we don't like to over wash our hair how often does ethan have to wash his hair probably daily i don't know he doesn't have any hair at least twice (laughs) at least twice daily twice daily right twice daily okay now this is really good wine it is very good wine i'm enjoying it yes sir so I know this question's been asked in the past, but it's definitely a question that comes up often. So I'm going Last to- Last time we drank Texas beer, now we drink Texas wine. This is a question <laughs> that was asked by two people. So I feel like it should be hit on again. One was from J underscore Lemke on Instagram. And one was from K Perry five. Do you know Katy Perry? Just asking. Are you the fifth Katy Perry? That's probably That's it. That's probably what it is. So, spay before or after the first heat cycle, and also a variation of the question is, when do you recommend spaying, neutering your bird dog? That's a great question so for me. So, we talked about this. <laughs> do you even know about this? No. no. Um, so, we talked about this. I don't know if it was the first video or the second video when we split up our last one. I can't remember um, either. Watch them both. They're both good. Yeah. Um, but the quick answer would be, uh, my general recommendation on bird dogs is spaying and neutering would be after... 12 to 18 months of age, at least in females after that first heat cycle. I think there's enough research that shows that that delayed um, spaying and neutering helps with um, development of cartilages, um, specifically ACL or CCL in dogs, um, and and then in, in the bone development. So I think those are really good ideas to, to wait. Um, male I actually dogs, talked to a lady today that was talking about a dog's holding their leg up, and I said, I mean, probably, probably CCL. Yeah. yeah, probably CCL. Yeah. And then you also talked about in that video, and I think it's a good thing to mention about why, yes, why waiting, but also good reasons too. Yeah. So yeah, waiting, waiting. So a five-year-old female dog has, that we're not breeding, has no reason to have a reproductive tract. So um, at that point, you know, our risk of pyometra, unplanned pregnancies, all those things are at a greater risk. Cancers. Cancer. Well, Cancers, there's bigger debate about that. Okay. Not that, as much well, studies showing. People, that used to be the reason everybody spayed early was that six month age is because everybody, there was one research study that showed that, you know, if you spayed before that first heat cycle, you reduce that risk. So if that's true, right, then we're not, we're not getting that benefit, but we can manage mammary tumors a lot easier, I think, than cruciate ruptures. 
um, which are very common. And the bad part about cruciate ruptures, usually the other one's going to rupture within a year. 50% of them will rupture within a year. So this is more of a wear-related injury than a than an actual trauma. Like in people, you step wrong and you tear stuff, or you twist yeah. wrong and you tear stuff. Yeah, it can just happen. Or, you know, if you're really unlucky, it happens like a week before pheasant season opens and then your dog's down for the year. So, And that is a really good segue into the next question that somebody wanted to ask. I did a segue not on purpose. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I'm also moderating this. So oh, I'm oh, going wow. to this question. So it's you, not me. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. It's me. <laughs> on Point Motorsports, any tips to avoid knee tears? Any over-the-counter stuff like glucosamine to help? Um, so any glucosamine chondroitin, you're never going to go wrong with it. You can never give a dog enough glucosamine chondroitin. So um, I think those are great products. Um, drawing a blank on the brand that we sell at the clinic. But, I mean, they're um, really, really good products out there, I think, that you can do. I'm not a big fan of the diet-based um, where they put the glucosamine chondroitin and less those products. Um, so most products, if they have, say they have glucosamine chondroitin. Like a dog food mm -hmm. specifically. That is, there's very, very few of them. Unless that product's put on after the cooking process, yeah. the cooking process kills that. Um, yep. So I would rather give it as a treat um, or as some kind of supplement. Like a supplement. Yeah, for sure. But I, you're never going to give too much of that. That's always going to help support good bone health. So as well as waiting to spay or neuter sure. yeah. until older. So what's the, the, the terminology for you get? A high enough dosage that it is really beneficial. What is, what is that? There's a term for that. There's something. It's called... Um, like a threshold, maybe? Well, with the glucose and chondroitin, it to be... Can we phone a friend? <laughs> we need, we need a, you're the friend I would phone. Um, so there's like supportive care, and then there would be... Therapeutic? Therapeutic. That's Therapeutic the levels. See? Therapeutic levels. I phone my own friend. Yes. And you, you can't get a therapeutic level out of the dog food unless the dog is eating more dog food than what it would need. Um, it depends on the dog food. But like I said, there's like count them on one hand the number of dog foods and they're really expensive. So I, you'll get a lot better um, if you're using therapeutic, using a, a supplement that is at a therapeutic level. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, <laughs> I think we're going to throw a training question in here. I don't know anything about that. I'm giving you a break so you can taste some more wine. Thanks. From Stoke Ventures, which this was also a common theme of questions, so I'm shooting your question out here, but there were others that were very similar. Okay. Do you recommend using the Easy Lead on puppies, and if so, how young? Great question. Um, yes and no. So with the majority of the dogs that we work with, we're looking at hunting dogs, and a big thing that we want to see out of hunting dogs is independence in the field. If they are independent, ready to hunt, willing to hunt, then they can start working on healing. And on average for us, we start dogs in the vicinity of five to six months with an easy lead. Um, usually not before then, unless you've got a special case, a real wild child. But most of these puppies that are under five, six months old are not so big and strong that even if they are pulling pretty consistently are jerk, yeah, be not going to be so hard to manage. Um, five to six months is pretty typical. Yes. Yes. So great uh, question. Another question from CDN blue. They signed their question Canadian blue. So appreciate that from Instagram. Are you attending any Canadian sports shows this year? Well, haven't been asked to any Canadian sports shows. But if you'd like to invite us to one, we'd be happy to go. Yeah, I'd like to go, to especially like in the summertime or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, leave the Texas July. heat. Yeah, that'd be great. July, yeah. right? You got any July right shows? in between your, your, your end of winter and start of winter. Mm -hmm. Yep. It'd be great. <laughs> okay, next question. This is a good one. Who's your mortgage guy? If you don't have access to pigeons bird launchers, what's another way to train whoa? Pigeons and bird launchers? Hang on, who's your mortgage guy's his name? That's the Instagram <laughs> the tag. Oh, who's, your, who's your mortgage guy? It's like, uh, I don't. Shout out to Prime West Mortgage. They're like, well, that's this place. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about why we end up using bird launchers, pigeon launchers because timing is really important when you're teaching a puppy to point. 
and you need to have control over the flush of the bird. What we're trying to do is get that puppy to instinctually and naturally want to hold point longer and longer and longer. And the way that you do that is by making them think that the first time they scented that bird and approached that bird, they overpressured it. That way they're going to be more cautious the next time they encounter that scent. And if you have that remote launch of that bird, you're showing them that, boom, you smelled that, that bird launched. So be more careful next time. And then you can hold that launch longer and longer and longer. If you don't have an electronic launcher, that makes that timing and that process much more difficult to recreate. It doesn't allow your puppy to naturally and instinctually learn that. If you're using a check cord, then you are physically restraining them. And then they're just waiting for that pressure to stop them instead of them doing it on their own. Um, there are mechanical releases, foot releases, string releases as well. Again, those are difficult because you either have to approach the bird to get it to flush with the foot release traps. And uh, with young puppies, you're not gonna have that kind of time. And the string release, again, you're gonna either have to have somebody standing right next to your bird, which your puppy's gonna run right up to him and be like, hey, what you doing out here in the field? Um, and so they're a big distraction to have them out there. Or you're gonna have to try and know where your string is so that you can be able to quick grab it and release it when your puppy approaches so they can make timing really difficult in those situations. Uh, but one way, if you don't have those items is wild birds. Puppies aren't gonna be able to overpressure or catch wild birds. And we don't want them to either, um, to catch them either, because if they catch them, then they're just rewarding themselves for not pointing. Yeah, so, so back in the day, people would always just say, I just took my dog out and ran them on birds and they figured it out. <laughs> took them hunting. I took them yeah. hunting. And I will say that was in the time period when there were A, more access to ground to hunt on and B, more birds readily available to run dogs on. And yes, I, I think that if I had access to unlimited numbers of wild birds, that wild birds would be the way that we would train a majority of the dogs. And what we're trying to do with electronic launchers and the equipment that we have today is to best simulate what a wild bird response would be to a dog. And the closest we can get to that, the better off the dogs are going to be. So. And my, my take on that, right, is like anything electronic, right, gives you the ability to give the appropriate correction or the appropriate positive reinforcement. Timing. Right, timing. Timing yeah, is timing everything. Is and so you can make those a lot easier. With Absolutely. that press of the button. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. You've got that immediate response. So, well, this always happens. We always have so many great questions and we have probably gotten to the point where we're going to have to break for part one and we will be back tomorrow for part two with more great questions from both Peter Armstrong, DVM, and the guy with the pink gun and Cat the dog trainer. This commercial brought to you by Grape, Grape, Creek, bleh, Grape Creek Wines. We're not sponsored, but I'd love to be. I don't even have a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a minute.